you brought your Bibles this morning, and I trust you have, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 13. If you find Exodus chapter 13, we touched Exodus a little bit last week when we were talking about Moses and his rod and how God took that surrendered rod and used it amazingly. And, you know, if all of us, if you're alive and you're breathing, are on a journey. Now, if you're truly saved, Jesus is your companion and the Holy Spirit is your guide and the Bible is your GPS. If you're not, well, you're just out there. Sorry. Okay. But irregardless, having Jesus with us and the Bible is our GPS and the Holy Spirit is our guide, that doesn't ever guarantee us that our journey will go according to our expectations or our plans. And that kind of brings up a question to me. If God truly leads us, then why don't things turn out exactly like I expect? I mean, how come I keep running into detours and, 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 and dead ends and, and, you know, dry, dusty, barren roads? Is it because God doesn't know how to read a map? Is it because I don't know how to follow or, 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 or that maybe somehow we're out of his will? Well, it's not necessarily that way, guys. And, you know, in, there are three things we need to learn about the unexpected things we come to in life, okay? Especially things like the detours and the dead ends and, and bitter waters and things like that. I, I don't know if you notice, there's a lot of construction going on at Seagaville lately. And if you use Malloy Bridge Road to get to Forney, we're kind of out of luck until next month. Okay, that's, that's a detour. I live down Malloy Bridge Road. If you go past Walmart, just before you get to that flashing light down there, that road, Ross Lane's where I live. So, and we normally go out that way, turn left, go through the bottoms, and we're into Forney. But now we got to get on Highway 175, go all the way to Crandall, take the first exit, 740, and we'll go down by the high school. That's kind of out of our way and inconvenient. But see, detours have a purpose. That means there's something going on, some improvement being made. Something's being done, and, and, there's, and there's, no, you know, there's no difference with our life. In fact, the first thing I want you to see is the purpose of detours. Look at Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. Okay? For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war, and returned to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Now, I want, you, I want to stop right there on that. I want you to notice the part that God led the people around. That means instead of God leading them the shortest way or the direct route, okay, he led them on a detour. On, on a kind of a, a, a different path. Now, why was that? Why didn't God lead them uh, and take just the shortest route? I mean, isn't the shortest route the straightest line between two distance? The way, the way the older folks said, my grandpa used to tell me, well, as the crow flies, which meant the straight line, this is the shortest distance. And that's true, it is the shortest route, but folks, it isn't always the best one. There is a purpose in detours, a divine purpose. God has a purpose in life's detours. In fact, he tells us very plainly right there why he didn't lead them directly. Look at verse 17 again. It says, God did not lead them by the way of the land of Philistines, although that was near. That means that, that was the short point going through Philistine. God said, no, we're going to go around it. Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, what's that mean? Well, God knew that if he took them through the mess direct route, they would have to go through Philistia. And if they went through Philistia, then they would have to meet the warlike Philistines. Then that means they would have been frightened. They just came out of captivity. The Philistines, the warlike Philistines, we're talking people like Goliath was a Philistine. And these guys were nothing but warriors. They fought all the time. They'd see those, and then they would have become frightened. And then when you got frightened, guess what happens? They would have become dismayed. Then they would have come discouraged, and then it would have been defeated, and it would have been all over, 
okay? So God led them on a detour because they weren't ready, okay? Understand that they weren't ready. And, and listen, I'm glad. Oh, I praise God that he knows the, what you and I are ready for. Because listen, God has a job for each of us, okay? For each one of you. He has a blessing that he wants to give you, and he has something he wants to do, and yet he may have you right now out in the wilderness going maybe round in circles or making what you think is a long detour. And you may think that you're out of the will of God or that God is punishing you somehow or that he's abandoned you, but I can tell you he hasn't. God is leading you on a detour because he knows that you're not quite ready for some of the things that he has in store for you. See, God didn't lead his people on the straightest route because they would get there too fast. They wanted it and they wanted it now, but they weren't ready. And listen, we're just like that sometimes. Okay, if we're honest, that's the way we are. We can't wait on God. We want it now. And so in our impatience, we take off like a rocket, but we come down like a rock. Okay, God led them on a detour through the wilderness to toughen them, to strengthen them, okay? I mean, the Bible clearly teaches that the wilderness was a place of hardness, of drought, of drudgery, and, and, and discipline. And what was God doing with them out there? He was simply preparing them for what was to come. They had to fight in Canaan. God promised them the Canaan, the promised land. He said, it's all yours. But he didn't say you're going to walk in and just sit down and take it. No, they had to go to battle. Of course, we know God battled for them. They knew there was a, there's a struggle ahead. God says, look, I got to get these guys ready. They've been in captivity for 400 and something years. They're beat down, okay? They, they, they're oppressed. I've got to get them strengthened back. Focus on me, focusing on me, what I can do through them. And so he's preparing them. Now, now, let's look. They didn't understand it, okay? They didn't know what was going on at the time. They didn't know all that God had in store for them. But guess what? And folks, here's the great thing for us too. They didn't have to know. It's enough that God knew. Okay? They had never seen or heard about the Philistines. But God did. And he wanted them to trust him. Okay? Put their faith in him. Now, have you ever stopped and pondered the fact, guys, that God will not do anything that's not in the best interest of his children? Why? Because he knows everything. He has the long-term perspective on what we need now to prepare us for the future. Now, listen, maybe you've been asking God for something and you don't have it. Maybe you've been praying and asking God about your, your, maybe your date life or your family life or your finances. Maybe you want to go to school or get into some ministry or the like, and it seems like all you're doing is going round in circles. Why? Well, the answer may simply be that you're just not ready. Remember that after God called Moses, Moses spent 40 years in the backside of the desert Herding goats and sheep, getting ready. He had to herd a million, million or so folks out of Egypt. Okay? After God called Paul, what happened? Y'all remember? He sent Paul down to Arabia to get him ready to be the missionary that went to the Gentiles and changed the world. See, don't get the idea that you always have to be going in a straight line or you're out of the will of God. No, the important thing is not what you know, or the important thing, should I say, is not that you know all the details. The important thing that God knows and you follow him. In fact, look down at verse 21 there and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He didn't take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, after they left Egypt, God didn't say, i done my job. Bye, guys. You're on your own. Have fun. Good luck. You know, you and Moses, go ahead and y'all have a good time. No, he didn't do that, okay? No, he led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, guys, the Bible teaches that those pillars represent the Holy Spirit given to lead them, okay? 
We have the Holy Spirit within us because Jesus went to the cross and died for us, and we accepted him as Lord and Savior, and he moves in. Here, because they, God is getting them ready when he goes, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail, but when he builds the temple, it's a complete shadow of Calvary and what's to come. Okay, we're on this side of the cross. They were on that side. So that pillar of fire represents the Holy Spirit given to lead them. It shows us that after God redeems us, he redeemed them from captivity in the Egyptian. Then he does that. He sends the Holy Spirit to lead us. And just as he was their guide through the wilderness of Sinai, the Holy Spirit is your guide in this day, in this age, in this wilderness that we're in. And we have to keep our eyes on that pillar and step by step, day by day, Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you can get mad at me for saying this if you want, but you do not need to know the who, what, where, when, or why. It's your job to make sure that you have your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and you follow what the Holy Spirit tells you to do in your heart. You must trust him. Why? Because God knows things you don't know. God sees Philistines you don't see. He sees weaknesses and dangers you don't know about. You just pray and you keep your eyes on him and remember that that there's always a purpose in divine detours. Now look, don't misunderstand me here, okay? Yes, it is possible that the reason you're going around the circles is because you're out of the will of God, okay? Okay? Yes, it is possible you're doing because you didn't read the map right or you didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. And because of that, you're stumbling around in a wilderness wasteland that you have no business being in. But God says you reap what you sow. Okay? You don't want to follow me. Fine. You do it your way. Then when you're ready, come back to me and I'll fix it. All right? But that's not the, if that's not the case, remember that detours exist because, again, construction is taking place. When you're on a highway and there's a detour, it's usually because they're needing to fix, build, correct, or improve something. And similarly, God will take us on a detour because he's constructing, correcting, improving, or fixing something in our lives as well. Now, now granted, detours are anything but convenient. Okay? I have to, my mother's doctors are in 40, and it, it's, it, yeah, it's inconvenient because now we got to leave 25, 30 minutes earlier just to get down and go the long way around where we just go down Malloy Bridge Road and cut through the bottomlands. It's inconvenient, yes, because they take me out of the way and take you longer than you originally planned, but folks, they're necessary. If they don't fix them two bridges down there, y'all know how often it floods down there. If they don't fix them two bridges, then bridges are going to fall and then they'll never be able to get around. It's necessary. And always remember that God is more interested. God is more interested in your development than your arrival. God cares more for your character than your comfort and more for your purity than your productivity. You say, well, why is that? Because God has a place and a purpose he wants you to live out. But it may not happen tomorrow, and it might. You probably won't get there by uh, going in a straight line. Rarely does God take someone to a destiny he has for them without taking them on a detour of, or, 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 or two or ten or maybe a hundred. There's always a purpose in God's detours. Okay? He led them into the wilderness to toughen, strengthen, and prepare them for what was ahead. And there may be a situation in your life right now, maybe, maybe in the life of the church or the life of someone you know, We're like, man, live. why are we having to go this long? Why can't we just go from here to here? Because God's doing something. There is a purpose. So the first thing I want you to see is there a purpose in detours. The second thing I want you to see is there is discipline in dead ends. Look at Exodus chapter 14, verse 8. Go up a few verses. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihirath, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. 
So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Now the Israelites, still being led by the Lord now, encounter something more aggravating than a detour. They hit a dead end where there ain't no place to go, or so they thought. There are mountains on the right, mountains on the left, okay? Dead Sea in front of them, and behind here, or the Red Sea, should I say, not the Dead Sea, the Red Sea in front of them, and behind them, Pharaoh with blood in his eye leading his chariots. It appeared as if they were boxed in, trapped with no way out. Their, their aggravation over their detour now turns to desperation. And guess what they did? They blamed Moses. Moses, what's wrong with you? Can't you read a map? You led us to a dead end. We should have stayed in Egypt. We told you that. They forgot. And sadly, and don't you ever forget this, that it wasn't Moses, lead, Moses leading them. It was God. Now, folks, listen. Just because a man stands in this pulpit and claims to be who he is, you let God lead you. He's supposed to be this piece right here. God is the head of the church. He's this piece, and we're the rest of the body. Anybody that claims to be of God. And you, individually, listen, God leads you. It's not wise to go blaming and pointing fingers because you got three fingers pointing back at you. Okay. Moses was just simply following the Lord. Therefore, they weren't there by chance or happenstance or accidents. God led them there on purpose. You say, well, how do you know that? Look at uh, Exodus 14, verse 1 and 2. Go back to 1 and 2. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihirath, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. Well, guys, they were exactly where God wanted them. That's where God wanted them to be. God led them there on a purpose. Why? Verse 3, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they're bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in. God led them in what appeared to be a dead end because he was going to bring judgment to Pharaoh and the dead end was bait. Verse 4, then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I'm the Lord. And they did so. Folks, listen. In life, you're going to find yourselves in situations that are not only aggravating, but appear to be hopeless. God is going to lead you to a place sometimes where it seems there's no way out, a place where no preacher can help you, where no self-help book or DIY book, do-it-yourself book can guide you, where there's no human way out, a place of desperation. And when you come to that place, don't panic. Don't begin to complain like the Israelites did. Instead, remember that there is not now will there ever be panic in heaven, just plans. God knew exactly what he was doing. The Israelites weren't out of the will of God when this happened. On the contrary, they were smack dab in the middle of God's will. Okay? It was all God's doing. And you say, well, why in the world would God lead them there? So that their place of desperation would become the place of dependence. They had no choice but depend on God or die. They were. If they didn't depend on God, they weren't going to fight. You remember the, the, the movie with Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments? They Grab rakes and grab hoes and grab all this. And, and Dathan says, what good are they going to do against chariots? Well, in a way, he was right. Okay? They, they, didn't stand, they, they didn't stand a chance. As the old saying goes, they stood about as much chance as a one-legged man in, in, a, in, a, in a hiney kicking contest. Okay? Pharaoh had his whole army. You remember the Egyptians had conquered most of the known world around that time, and the Hebrews were enslaved. They didn't have no place out, so it was a desperation, okay? 
And listen, God does the same for you and I. He sometimes leads us to the place of desperation, a place where there seems to be absolutely no human way out, and all we can do is cast yourself completely, totally upon the Lord. Why? The answer is found in verse 13. Go down to verse 13. Look at verse 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now, when God leads you to that place of desperation, the place where there seems to be no way out. It's because he wants four things from you. Four things he just mentioned right there. Number one, don't be afraid. Okay? Did you know that 365 times in the Bible, one time for every day of the year, God says, fear not or do not be afraid. Don't believe me? Go home and count them. Get out your concordance. And count them, 365 times God says, fear not or don't be afraid. And yet, we still fear the unknown. Those of us who can claim to be God's children fear the unknown. So in order to teach you not to be afraid, God will take you to a place where it seems to be all kinds of things to be afraid of. I don't know where it will be or how you're going to get there, but God will bring you to that place of desperation so that you will learn there's nothing to fear. Because listen, fear, guys, the truth is, is unbelief. Whether you want to admit it or not, fear is unbelief. Okay? Fear comes when we don't trust God, and when we don't trust God, we don't follow God, and God can't lead a parked car. That's what it comes down to. You'll never get past the wilderness of unbelief unless you take to heart what God tells you in Hebrews 13, 6, which said, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Yeah, okay, I'll be honest, so what? They can beat me up pretty bad, shoot me if they want to. But that's nothing. Take me home to Jesus, I'm ready. Man, I am, I'm ready. I would love to be able to wake up, well, I don't know if we'd wake up, but I'd love to be able to get up in the morning and out of my heavenly bed and not have to put on three sets of braces and take 22 pills from my heart and all this other stuff. Praise God. You want to shoot me? Go ahead. Do me a favor. I'm not suicidal. Y'all don't get, oh, David's suicidal. He wants somebody to kill him. No, I don't have a death wish. But I'm just being honest. Sometimes the aches and the pains and the hurting and the trying to stand and just do a normal life. Go walking around in some, the, a store or something with my wife without having to get a handicap card or use my walker. Goodness gracious, to be able to walk across a parking lot sometime. I wish I could do it again. But my body's breaking down. I abused it when I was younger. I can't blame God. I can't say, God, it's your fault. I abused it when I was younger. I was in the military. Ten and a half years, I traveled the world playing ball for the Air Force. Because that's what they did. They go into places, play ball, and that's a recruiting tool. Well, you know, I tore my body up. Now my knees are telling me about it. I just can't do the things I used to do. So listen, what I'm saying is that God is my helper. I wonder what can man do to me? So the first thing, don't be afraid. Okay, I got a bad heart. They tell me I got an aneurysm growing just below the place where they just put in a, a, a new phony tube to fix the last aneurysm. If it goes pop, it goes pop, I'm down, I'm it. That, Y'all don't even got to bother calling. I just get, you know, hey, come haul this. Throw me in the back of your truck and just haul me down. Say, don't roll me out in the emergency room. He's dead. Well, no, they're honest with me. I said, look, if it bursts, there ain't nothing we can do. Praise God. Okay? So do I be afraid? No. I, I ain't worried about it. You want to know why? Because God is the one here with me. He knows what I'm going through. And you know what? He still has a purpose for me. Praise God, he allows me to teach the Sunday school department that I teach. Praise God, he allows me to go and supply preach. Oh, praise God for all of it. So number one, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid for what's ahead. Church, listen, I know y'all are facing some major decisions, I'm told. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what comes. 
Don't be afraid of the vision that, that God gives you and the leaders of the church. Just follow. Secondly, he says, stand still. Look at verse 13 again, okay? And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still. Now, why did God tell them to stand still? Because there's nothing they could do. It was out of their hands, okay? I mean, think about it. it was out of that. What in the world were they going to do against the Egyptian army and all of his chariots? Well, they get dead a lot faster. What do they do? Stand still. And what about you? Have you learned to stand still when there's nothing you can do? Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. When God leads you to a place where you're hemmed in, to see here, a mountain there, a mountain there, and the devil behind you, a place where there's no way but up, just stand still. And listen, I'll be honest, that's a hard thing to do because we always think we've got to do something even if it's wrong. Don't we? Yes. Even if it's wrong, we've got to do something. And because of that, God sometimes has to put us in a place where there's nothing we can do, no counsel we can go to, no friend that can help. There's no one to turn to. And God says, be still. Why did he tell us to be still? Look what he says next. And see the salvation of the Lord. Now listen, that doesn't mean see it after it takes place. When Moses told them this, it hadn't taken place yet. Remember, they're surrounded. Pharaoh's behind them. And he says, see, see the salvation of the Lord. Wait a minute, where is it? It hadn't taken place yet when he told them that. In other words, stand still and watch God do it. Stand still and see what God's going to do. Stand still long enough to see what God's going to do before he does it. Listen, we must come to a place in our life that a time of faith we simply say, I refuse to fear, I'll stop and I place myself in your hands and God, if you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. And now by faith, I see my way out even when I don't see it. And then look what he tells me, he says, go forward. Look at verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now you say, wait a minute, David. There's a contradiction. On one hand, God says, stand still. And on the other hand, he says, go forward. No, 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 no. There's no contradiction. For God will show you the way, a way you've never seen before. All right, you see, God is saying that you have to get to a place of total confidence where by faith you stand still until you see his action and then move in a way you've never done before. Lotus verse 16. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You know what God does to dead ends, guys? He turns them into eight-lane highways. And like I told you last week, they went through the Red Sea without even getting their sandals damp. God knows the way through. Have you come across anything that, that seems uncrossable to you? Do you have mountains you can't climb or you can't tunnel through? Well, I'm telling you, God specializes in doing the impossible. He knows a thousand ways to make a way for you. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer, no. No. Every so-called impossibility is God's opportunity to display his glory. And if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit with your eyes on those pillars of cloud and fire, God can and will make a way for you. You may not see it. You just got to go forward. What does that mean? That means you keep walking with God. You keep praying. You do whatever you can do, and you keep going forward. Don't stop and go backwards. You want to know why? That's what backsliding is, because God's going to keep moving forward. And if you stop, you're going to be going backwards. That's not what you want, okay? So he tells us, hey, go forward. So he says, hey, listen, <laughs> look at what you've got to do. Do not be afraid, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, and go forward. Trust me, go forward. So listen, there is discipline and uh, there's purpose to detours, okay? And then there's dead ends. And then the third thing I want you to see real quick is the testing of bitter water. Look at chapter 15, 
verse 22 and 23. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out to the wilderness of Shur. Oh, sure, let's go. And three days in the wilderness, they found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Now, Marah means bitter, by the way. They're in the wilderness, bone-weary, hungry, thirsty. They come to this place of, of, of bitterness and barrenness. Again, again, God hadn't sent them there because they've done something wrong. This isn't punishment. When they came to the place in the wilderness when there was no water, it wasn't because God was mad at them. It wasn't because they'd sinned. It wasn't because Moses had a bad, was a bad leader and the devil didn't make him do it, okay? They're here by divine providence. God brought them here again for a purpose. You want to see what the purpose is? Look down to verse 25 there in chapter 15. He cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the water, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Now, see those words, tested them, okay? Now, when they, when they debut a new car or they make a new car, they take it out to the test track or what they call the proving ground. Y'all know what that is? That, that's where they put it through the paces. You've seen advertisements of them going around and, and, and skidding and sliding through water and over bumps and all of that kind of stuff. They call that the proving ground. They put little letters down there, do not try this at home, okay? But anyway, that's exactly what this was for God's people. God was now proving them, and it's the same for you. If you follow the Lord, then you're going to find your life is going to be one of detours and dead ends and dry holes, okay, because, ladies and gentlemen, you not because you've done something wrong, but because you're walking in the Spirit. Now, that's quite a revelation because so many times the first thing we think, well, what went wrong? How did I screw this up? Nothing went wrong. Not a thing in the world went wrong. God is on the throne. He's leading you. When you come to the disappointment of a dry hole in bitter waters, he's given you a test. And notice what Israel, how they passed their test. Look what they did at their test. Okay? Look at verse 24. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Well, they failed. They failed it miserably. How they complained against Moses. Just three days ago, they came through the Red Sea on God's superhighway, and they were dancing and, and leaping and ecstatic with joy, and they were praising the Lord. And now they're complaining. In three days, Moses went from hero to zero. Okay? You say, okay, well, so what? Folks, learn this. When you come to a disappointment in life, when you come to a dry hole along the way, the bitter, there's no motel anywhere with hot and cold running water, and it seems like life has done you dirty. You know what you're really doing when you complain? Well, Exodus chapter 16, verse 8. You might want to put a star by this one. It's one of the greatest lessons you and I can ever learn. Look at it. And Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning, bread to the full, for the Lord hears your complaints, which you made against him. Complaints against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. What's Moses saying? Folks, listen. Teenagers who complain about your parents, God gave you those parents. People who complain about their teacher, their pastor, their boss, their job, or their families, God gave those to you. You husbands who complain against your wives and wives who complain against your husbands, God gave you to each other. See, the point is, God gave them Moses, and they complained against Moses. And when they complained against Moses, since God gave them, in reality, they were really doing was complaining against God. And when God in his wisdom leads you into some of life's bitter waters and you complain, you're really complaining against God. And folks, complaining is no little sin. It's a big one. You say it is. Yeah. Did you know that God lists complaining with idolatry and fornication? He does. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, 
The people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. God lists murmuring or complaining with tempting Christ, fornication, and idolatry, and lusting. Why did they complain when they came to this place? I mean, why? God was leading them. The pillar of cloud was there. The pillar of fire was there. Moses was there. The word of God was there. So why did they complain? It was the lack of faith and lack of reason. Think about it. Would God really have brought them through the Red Sea just to bring them to a place and let them die without water? Had God marvelously delivered them in order to destroy them? Doesn't make sense. I mean, listen, if Jesus Christ died for you on that cross and has saved you, do you really think he saved you to abandon you and to leave you to your own? No. When you come to a place like this, do you think that God brought you so far, that God did so much, that God had so much invested in you, and he invested in you a lot, the life of his very son, all that he did that for you, and after having brought you that far and died for you, that now he's going to abandon you? Listen, can't you understand that their complaining was rooted, guys, again, in unbelief? And that's a terrible, horrible sin against God. Now notice what God did. Look at verse 24 and 25. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. God showed Moses a tree. And the thing you need to notice here is that the whole time they were complaining, listen to me, the whole time they were complaining, that tree was right there. It wasn't hidden. It was right there. God already knew what he was going to do, and he already made provision for them. Again, there's no panic in heaven. You see, listen, that tree speaks of Calvary and the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says in 1 Peter that Jesus died on that tree. God brought them to this place of bitterness that he might display to them by type, by picture, and by symbol the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in dry, barren, bitter places, guys, Jesus is enough. Oh, <laughs> how the Lord wants us to learn that. Too many times when God leads us to where he wants to test us, we, like the Israelites, fail. Now, you know what the amazing thing about this was? They couldn't see it. But if you read on just a few more verses, right over the hill, not very far away, was a gorgeous beautiful oasis if you look down at exodus 15 verse 27 it says when they came to elam there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees so they camped there by the waters it was just over the hill now listen there's somebody maybe in here this morning that's camped in a dry barren area and the only water you can find is bitter you may be thinking that, you know, God's just walked off and left me. No, he hasn't. He's testing you. You may not, you may, you're, you're not necessarily out of the will of God, but God brought you here. Okay? It's right on the map. That's the route. That's exactly where God wants you. Don't complain because not only is Calvary sufficient for you, but right over the hill, God has an oasis. Okay, You can't see it, but God can. Remember, the important thing in life is not for you to know what God knows. You'll never know that. I'm sorry, you just never will. Okay, His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. The important thing for you to do in life is this. Keep your eye on the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, which translated in New Testament times, is that you walk in the Holy Spirit and keep your heart right with God. And if you go on a detour, praise God. If you come to a dead end, praise God. You get to sit still and breathe for a minute. 
Life's too fast. Okay? Praise God. And if you come to bitter waters, praise God. Why? Because he knows the way through it all. All you have to do is follow. The question is, will you? Will you trust him? Will you follow him and let him have his way? If not, why not? Heads bowed and eyes closed. If not, why not? That's an honest question. Will you trust him? And you can say, you know, Brother David, listen, I do trust him. All right, I believe you, but let me ask you this. Do you trust him with everything? And I mean everything. Not just a few things. You see, it's been my experience that most of us who say we trust the Lord, and I say us, I was there like this once, we allow Jesus to come and live in the house, but we treat him like a guest and say, yep, Lord, you got run of the house, but this room is off limits. You, you can't go in here. Do you trust him with everything? That's what we talked about last week, and Moses' rod became God's rod. This week, God led them. Okay, there was a purpose for detours. There was a reason for the dead ends. And those bitter wells are weighed sweet because that's what God planned. God has a plan for every one of you in here. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, you'll never realize that plan because you've taken your life in your own hands and you're going your own way. And if you die without Jesus, there's only one place for you, a place that wasn't prepared for you, that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You will spend eternity in the smoking section. And if you're in here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, yes, your destiny is fixed. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you and thereby, when our time here ends, we will go and be with him. But let me ask you this. Are you trusting him as you go through this journey on life? He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for the detours to make you stronger, to construct a few things. He has a purpose for those dead ends and a purpose for the bitter waters to test you. Are you truly trusting him? If there is anything in your life this morning, Christian, those that are true believers, that you have not turned over to Jesus, I want to urge you to do so today. To do so today. Let God have it. Because he knows the way. And you just follow him. Will you do that this morning? We're going to sing here in a moment. And when the music starts, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to come. Me or one of these gentlemen would be glad to tell you how to get to know him to be how to get how to get him to be your personal savior. And if you need to pray, you just come down here. The altar is open. You can be right where you are, near where you are. If you want me to pray well for you or one of the other gentlemen to pray for you, we will. But please don't leave here the same way you walked in here. Let go and let God. Father, we pray right now. This invitation, Father, it's yours. I got no tuck with it, Father. I've, I've done what I believe that you laid on my heart through the Holy Spirit. Father, now the invitation is yours. You've touched hearts in here. I know you have because your word tells me that your word will not come back void. And Father, I pray you give courage and strength for the folks here today to do whatever it is they need to do with you. Whatever it may be, give them the strength right now during this time of invitation. Father, we praise you for what you're about to do. And we give you the praise and glory the name above all names the name of your most precious son jesus amen as we sing you guys need to come you come <laughs>